You are listening to the SDSU podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagberdian and Paul Garrison. Welcome, listeners, back to another episode of the SDSU Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Hagverdian. We'll be joined shortly by my co-host, Paul Garrison. Today is episode 124, and we are beginning a, a, a podcast series where we are interviewing the new coaching staff at San Diego State Football. We obviously know that Sean Lewis was named the new head coach uh, in late November, early December, he assimilated a, a, a full coaching staff turnover. Demetrius Sumler, the cornerbacks coach, uh, it was the only coach that was retained at the position that he held last year. Ryan Lindley was also retained on the staff, although he went from offensive coordinator to senior offensive analyst. Uh, and a slew of new coaches have come in that, frankly, we and Aztec fans are not very familiar with. And so I think this podcast series where we get to chat with uh, a lot of the new coaching staff should help all of us get to know those coaches better. Uh, first up is Zach Barton. He is the asso- associate head coach, special teams coordinator, and tight ends coach for San Diego State. A lot of titles, a lot of hats that he wears that he will talk about uh, during the interview. Uh, we also get a better idea of his coaching philosophy and you know, how, you know, his familiarity with Coach Lewis is uh, part of the reason why he is at San Diego State now. Let's get to the interview with Coach Barton, and then Paul and I will be back at the end to give you some of our takeaways uh, before we close it out. We want to welcome Coach Barton, SDSU's Associate Head Coach, Special Teams Coordinator, and Tight Ends Coach to the podcast. How are you doing today, Coach? Good. Appreciate you guys having me. You, uh, I just kind of named off uh, some of your roles. You know, you wear a lot of hats. Could you describe what you do here at San Diego State? Oh, well, you named it. I mean, I try to, The my biggest purpose is, is special teams, obviously. You know what I mean? Um, and then working from uh, the associate head coach title deal, that is Coach Lou trying to do me a solid because he knows I want to be head coach one day. You know what I mean? So uh, titles really don't mean a lot. It just, it just helps on the resume. Um, he knows where I want to get to eventually. Um, and I want to be a head football coach and he's, he's helping me. He's helping me get there, uh, which I really appreciate. Does, does having that title give you any extra game day responsibilities or things like that? I think I just offset Lou really well. You know what I mean? He is, he's ultra positive, uh, and silver lining at all times. You know what I mean? He's offensive coach that calls the play. And then before the play even happens, he puts his, he puts his arms up to signal touchdown. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I'm an old defensive guy. And I, I say, you know, knock that, knock that shit off. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I, I try to help as much as I can. I try to keep as much things off his plate uh, as humanly possible while, you know, not overstepping my bounds. You know what I mean? Um, uh, which is, which is a fine line, but I, I try to, I know how he likes things done. Um, I, I know his hot buttons and I try to, alleviated that as much as I possibly can while making sure I'm staying in, staying in my lane. Um, so of all the opportunities in the coaching world, you know, you chose to reunite with coach Lewis, you know, what is it about him that uh, is somebody that you want to be working for and with? Well, I met um, coach Lewis when we were GAs at UNO. Um, so it's been, it's been, it's been a long time. Um, first and foremost, uh, he's a, Obviously, he's a phenomenal football coach, but more important than that, he's a phenomenal human being. He, he does things the right way. He's a great husband. He's a great father. You know what I mean? Um, it's a it's a no brainer working for him because of the type of person he is. You know what I mean? Um, so getting the chance to come back and and be with him was was easy for my my wife and I and, and our family to. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, I've worked for a lot of guys, a lot of a lot of other head coaches, and 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 I'm extremely biased. Um, I think Coach Sawyer, who I worked for at Winona State, very similar human beings uh, that way. And when you can work for a guy like that, um, it, it's easy, man. Like you're you're 
your livelihood and how much you enjoy going to work is directly related to your boss, right? And if you have a you have a great boss and, and you're aligned, it it makes coming to work every day uh, a lot of fun. So when you look back at all those places that you've been, or even before, um, what what are some of those influences on your coaching, and what did what are the things that you learned that that, that would just kind of like pop up off the top of your head? Well, the biggest thing to me is when I was younger, I tried to be all these guys that, that, you know, my mentors or whatever, I tried to be those guys, you know what I mean? And, and as I've gotten older, I've learned, um, to be myself, you know what I mean? Um, you, obviously you learn little pieces from everybody that you've worked for. You try to take the good and emulate it. You try to take the bad, and not do it. You know what I mean? Um, the biggest factor in my life and always will be my dad. My dad was a head football coach at the same place for 40 years. Hmm. And I saw him win 10 straight district championships and be, the smartest guy in the room and then go on a run where he, they didn't win any games. And he went from being the smartest guy in the room to the biggest uh, dumbass in the room, you could say. Um, so learning from and watching that and being a part of that and watching him and how he handled things when they were good and bad, uh, just trying to be consistent every single day. But from working from everybody, you try to do the same thing, right? Like, you try to take what they do really well and see how it fits you. And you try to eliminate all the bad things that you, you don't like, you know what I mean? And I think I, where I've gotten better is, Hey, if you make a mistake once, try not to keep doing it. You know what I mean? Um, and, and learning from that. And I, I've certainly, especially in the special teams world, taken over that side of things. Um, you, you can't make the same mistake twice because usually that mistake is, is going to cost you a, a football game. Um, so a little bit of everybody. And I think where I've gotten better is I've stopped trying. I'm just going to, I'm going to be me. What you get is what you get. And I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to be me and I'm going to stop worrying about the rest of it. So, uh, I mean, this is a kind of, we were, the idea of this the interviews and stuff is, is we don't know who you are yet fully. Yep. So, so, so tell us, I mean, what does that mean for you to be you? Well, was, we were walking off the field with Coach Lewis yesterday. I said the same thing to him. Like these guys don't really know me yet. I am, um, I'm cut and dry to the point, like you're, you're a product of your environment, right? My dad was a football coach. Mm -hmm. So I was raised in an environment where, you know, raising your voice, that was, a, that was, that's normal to me. Hey, mm -hmm. go get the milk at a high decibel, you know what I mean? With a sense <laughs> of urgency. Yeah. That's what it always was. Yeah. And you, you've got to realize that like these guys that I'm meeting with now, I'm doing the same thing with the team. Like you said, hey, you don't know me yet. I'm still going through this with the team. You know what I mean? Um, and being in front of those guys is, I'm still getting to know how they learn best and they're still getting to know me. You know what I mean? Um, and we had a pump period yesterday that didn't, didn't go great. That didn't, didn't, didn't meet the standard is, is not going to meet the standard, uh, especially here with what they've had special teams wise. You know what I mean? Um, I think for the first time they kind of saw that glimpse of um, the urgency that, that you need to have every day. Um, so we're, we're getting there, but that's what I say. I am like, I said that before, like coach Lou is, unabashingly positive all the time. Uh, I am, I am gloom and doom. I'm always worried about what's around the next corner. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when it's tough to have high blush pressure when you're 15. Uh, that's my personality, man. I am, I'm on edge at all times. I'm worried about what's going to go wrong at all times. I think I try to coach hard all the time. Um, like right now, like I'm, I'm making this cut up today and like, I've got to get impressed to these guys how important every day is. You know what I mean? Like we lost a day yesterday. We can't afford to lose a day. We can't afford to lose a period. We can't afford to do a drill and not understand why we're doing a drill. And, you know, I think the biggest thing that capitalizes me is like I say, like practice repetition is game reality. Like I want to control everything. And that's what's so hard is because when you get to a game, I got no control anymore and I got to let it go and let them do it. You know what I mean? But if I can get them to treat practice like a game, like that level of urgency at all times when we're out on the grass, then I think I'm doing a good job where I don't think I do a good job is that kind of wears on people. Cause I'm mm -hmm. always bearing down. And now with um, today's kids, that's not great. You know what I mean? Like some kids just aren't going to respond to that level of coaching. So I've got to figure out individually coaching special teams, you're coaching everybody. All right. Who can handle that all the time and who can't like Jay Sean Polk, um, was with us at Kent and is here now with us. 
And I said to Jay Sean, like the other day during practice, when we were practicing on Sunday, Saturday night, I was like, Hey man, like we got to have some fun. And he looked at me like I was crazy. Cause I don't think he'd ever thought that those words were ever going to come out of my mouth. You know what I mean? Like, he looked at me like, who the hell are you? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I would say like, I would say high strong is kind of my personality, uh, type a all the way. Um, I mean, that's what I mean. Before I've always worked at trying to change that and being somebody else. Like I can't change it. That's who I am. Like, you know what I mean? Like Murph, our video guy, you know, wants to kill me because we go through the cut up and one clip's wrong and it ruins my day. You know what I mean? Um, a lot of times I go home and my wife will look at me and just ask me like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't have a great answer for you, honey. Uh, <laughs> it's just, just, it's just, just who I am. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. And it's hard with the guys until I get to know them, you know what I mean? Until we get to that point and I get to know how they learn best, trying to keep that kind of in check all the time. You know what I mean? Like when you have a kid that just came in and we're new, like, hey, let's ask him how his day's going, not his footwork on the backside on the zone side. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to hit him with that every time you see him. You know what I mean? You right. can you just have a normal conversation with a guy. Um, so I, that's who I am in a nutshell, and I'm, I'm working on it. I have to work on it every single day um and i told lou when i got back with him like hey i'm gonna i want to because we were at kent we were always worried about the next thing you know what i mean the next getting to a bowl game getting the the next thing like i want to actually try to enjoy some aspect of this this time around you know what i mean how lucky we are to be here how lucky we are to be back together and really try to enjoy this process instead of making it such a emotional grind day to day Absolutely. I think the San Diego weather could help with that a little bit. Yeah, this um, isn't, well, in some places, it's not like this or other places. Up there. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I was born and raised here, man. If it's uh, above, if it's below 68 and above 72, I question God's love for me. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm there. But if you're looking at, if you're looking at, you know, just in general, like what is a special teams player that that, that is exceptional, is good at his job for you? I think like, I think Deke called them uh, Creed guys. You know, we've got the Creed here and we're going back and kind of looking through, so he called them Creed guys. I think that's a great way to, a great way to describe them, you know, especially here at this institution. Um, that's what you're looking for. You know what I mean? I'm looking for guys that are all in, you know what I mean? They're not putting their pinky toe in the water. They're cannonballing in on that deal. Um, Cause the special teams are, we're asking those guys to do things that are not natural. You know what I mean? Like, hey, man, I want you to run as fast as you can and not break your feet and hit that guy. You know what I mean? Or same thing, like we got our kickoff return at our Aztec. Hey, man, this guy's running full speed. We'll try to take some steam off it, but you're going to you're gonna have about five yards and you're going to put your knees in front of his and you're going to wear it. You know what I mean? So you got to be a little bit different. And I'm looking for guys that, you know what I mean? They don't have to be the most talented guys. The The – if you can get your best player to buy in and have that mindset where they'll do anything for the team, because that's what special teams is, then you're going to be really good. We had a kid at Kent, Jamal Parker, who's still playing in the Canadian league, who was our best player and was our best special teams guy. And that's the best we've ever been teams wise. We had elite specialists and we had our best player on the team that everybody looked up to was all in. You know what I mean? Um, and if you can get a guy that you can get the really good ones to show everybody else that they're willing to do the hard things, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, you're going to have a really good culture and that's anything. You know what I mean? Like I think special teams culture is a direct reflection of your team culture. You know what I mean? Cause special teams is all about us, everybody. You know what I mean? If you have a really good team culture, you're going to have a good special teams culture. And that's why I think it's so important to develop that at the same level, or it's got to be just as important as your team culture. Your special teams culture has got to be, you know what I mean? To me, it's the it's the same it's the same thing. So, everything that we preach culturally that Coach Lou believes in, we're preaching the same exact thing, special teams wise. You know what I mean? And it's easier here because Coach Lou actually coaches a uh, position on every single unit, and he's he's involved in it. So, like when we go to punt, he's got the gunners. When we go to KOR, he's got the tight ends and the fullbacks. You know what I mean? Uh, so he's got he's in, he actually coaches like a position with each group so he's in every special teams meeting so when the kids see that it makes it easy for me to be my job but as a special teams coach like it's your scheme and then driving culture you know what I mean like that's that's huge so I mean and here this is unlike any other place I've ever been 
because most of the places you came in and the culture, special teams wise, wasn't good. You know what I mean? And then you come into a place like this where the culture on special teams has been, I use the word elite, you know what I mean? What they've done over the years has been, it's a different deal now for me. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Um, so we've got to figure out a way to maintain that standard and figure out a way to make it better. You know what I mean? So this is this specific situation has been a little bit unique for me because you're not starting at ground zero. You know what I mean? Like there's been a, a really good foundation that's been laid here. You know, and over the years, everywhere you've been through the last decade, like this place has been a lead on teams. So the other stress that adds to me is we got to figure out a way to keep it there. You know what I mean? Um, you also have tight ends under kind of your umbrella. I know uh, Brian Lindley as a senior analyst is helping out in that regard, but what makes for a, a great tight end in Sean Lewis's offense? Well, we've had over the years, we've had guys that can't ideally you want a guy that can do everything. So besides the quarterback in this system, tight ends are going to be asked to do everything. They got to know everything conceptually in the pass game. And then in the run game, then uh, the misconception with us is because we go fast that we don't run the ball. Like that's the farthest thing from the truth ever. Most teams that go at this tempo run one or two plays and that's it. I mean, we run every run play imaginable. Um, and those guys are on the backside. They're at the point They we, you know, they, they have to be able to do it all. So it's been hard to find a guy. We, we had a guy that's like, he's, he's good split out. You know what I mean? Or we've had a guy um, that's really good in line. He's a really good blocker and couldn't catch COVID. You know what I mean? Like we need to figure out a way to <laughs> combine those things. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. it's, it's what we want. We want to be in 11 personnel, but when we say 11 personnel, we want to have that guy that can line up as the one, can line up in the backfield, can move all over the place, um, hold the point, you know what I mean? Um, and be a vertical threat. So it's, I mean, it's, it's you're looking for a unicorn, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that guy's got to be pretty special. I think the kid, I think we have some guys in that room that can do that. Um, Jude Wolf from USC fits, I mean, 6'5", 245 between 245 and 250 every day. And it's not difficult for him to stay there. You know what I mean? That's just who he is when he rolls out of bed. Um, Logan Tanner is going to be a really, really good football player. You know what I mean? And coach will get in 12. And hey, if our tight ends are our two best guys, we're going to be in 12. But we'll still be in 10 personnel right. formations but right. we'll be at 12 um so he's gonna put the best guys on the field and then match it off of what they do you know what i mean so i think the kid at eastern illinois for him um had over 75 catches as a y you know what i mean um then we've had a kid like a kent that was a phenomenal inline guy like we go to georgia and he can block those guys one-on-one -on -one. you know what i mean but he finished the year with like 11 catches so we got to somehow find a happy medium in there where we're going to be able to do both. Um, and I think we've got guys in the room this year um, that can do it. And then obviously having Coach Lindley here is massive for me because I can, like, you got him. I'm going with a specialist. You know what I mean? Like, um, a guy that that caliber that's called an offense, played in the NFL, coached in the NFL. You know what I mean? Like, um, keeping him here was a coup. Was uh, I mean, we're so much better with Coach Lindley then without, I can't like, you know what I mean? Like you can say whatever you want, but when you're having to coach full-time coach position and run all the special teams with no help, it's a, that's a lot. You know what I mean? So having Lindley here is, is made like, I don't know what we do without him to be honest with you, uh, with where we're at right now. Um, and what he's been able to help us with this spring and him being able to simulate to what we're doing has been uh, awesome to watch. Um, last question for us before we uh, let you get on with your day. You know, we – what do you think makes an elite position coach or a coordinator? Like, if we're talking to you in January after the season and we're talking about the great job that you did, what did you do that season? I think you connected with the kids and figured out a way to communicate um, in a way that they understood and then they could translate it. You know what I mean? I think that would be it. If we get to a point where – these guys understand what we're doing and why we're doing it and mm. then can execute it. And I put them in a position to be able to do that. You know what I mean? No matter who it is, like I put them in the best possible position to be successful. I'm going to be, then I'll be able to go home and put my head down and not care what anybody thinks and 
You did great. Nice sleep. The biggest, the nightmares for me is like when you go back and watch the things through all the games that we played is like, you know, as a coach, when you cut the film on, if you put that kid in the right position or not, you know what I mean? So the, the, the number of those I can limit, you know, we get done with the game and I know that, Hey, like I did everything I possibly could when they left the boundary to take the field, to put them in the best possible position to be successful. Um, I'll be in good shape. If they can tell you that too, you know what I mean? If they, enjoy coming to work every day and they know that we're working for them and they know that we're putting them in a good position. I, I would be very, I'd be happy, man. Woo. Great interview coach. We could do this for an hour, man. Fantastic. I get a little wordy. That was great. great. All good. We appreciate you taking the time. I know spring practice is a busy time for everybody, uh, but we definitely love getting an insight into you and uh, definitely look forward to chatting with you more as a, as the year goes on. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for the support. Thank you. Thank you. But see ya. Welcome back, guys. That was our interview with Coach Zach Barton, one of the newest uh, assistant coaches on the San Diego State staff under Sean Lewis. Um, you know, you wrote an article, Paul, about Coach Barton. Uh, I think he used the he's the yin to Sean Lewis's yang. Yeah, which is a perfect uh, analogy based on what he told us. Yeah. So um, you want to kind of expound on what you talked about in your article? Sure. I mean, I think the biggest thing is just that, you know, I, I, I did. Okay. Here's the part that I couldn't fit, figure out how to fit into my article. Okay. Um, yeah. th th they kept announcing all of these guys who were being hired by Sean Lewis. And the funniest part about all of them is they all had the same sense of fashion. So they had bald hair. And big old beards to the yeah. point that when they announced Coach Barton, it was like, oh, oh, where's his beard? Like, what's going on? He needs to have a beard. He needs to be bald. So I was very happy to see that he got his beard, right? Um, but, you know, it, it's this interesting thing. It's like, okay, so who are the people that Sean Lewis is surrounding himself with? Is he surrounding himself with disciples who literally just kind of like look like him? But are they going to be able to like contrast him? Are they going to be able to you know, tell him maybe when he has a bad idea, are they going to be able to write, which is an essential part of coaching. And I shouldn't even say that there are some coaches who are just genius who get away with not having that kind of contrast. Um, and, and so it was very interesting to talk with coach Barton and to see exactly that, that not only has he surrounded himself with a lot of the same Sean Lewis has surrounded himself with a lot of the same kind of upbeat, go for it kind of guys but he's also surrounded himself with people with the same vision but who bring it from a different perspective um and so i just thought that it was a really impressive mixture to be able to to have somebody who could say like you know we complement each other well um and he's he's always going to like assume that his you know touchdown is always going to be the result of his offense and i'm a defensive guy he's like stop showing up the defense you know and, and you could see that, that, I think, that mixture. And so that's what I was trying to get at um, at the article and then also trying to just give a little bit of the, the biographical part. I thought it was super fascinating um, that, uh, you know, until maybe he becomes a head coach himself somewhere, he's always kind of in the shadow of his dad who, um, you know, there's some great, great uh, articles that are still just floating around. People archive them. Um, there's one that just goes through like the entire day of what the dad did when he was a high school coach and all the film and all the meetings and all the stuff. And it's just crazy the dedication that these guys have to this um, vocation and, um, you know, back in Virginia where, where he's at and, and just all of the different pieces of it, man, it, it, it was pretty cool. Yeah, two things stuck out to me. One was definitely his awareness that he was stepping into a special teams unit that had been very very good mm -hmm. before him right you know, he, he mentioned usually when you're a new coach you're a new special teams coordinator you're there to fix the the mess or the problem but he that's not the case here right and although he didn't mention names like obviously he's alluding to doug deacon and bobby Houck, who were the special teams guys for the last i don't know five or six years and you know you could probably say the one coach that aztec fans probably wanted to stay or to, to see him stay was Doug Deacon because mm -hmm. the special teams had been so good. Um, so yeah, you know, coach Barton realizes he's stepping into a situation that was really, really good. And 
he needs to keep it really, really good and, and not take steps back. And even though they have to replace um, Jack Browning, who's a kicker, punter, kickoff guy, uh, there's still a lot of guys that played special teams on that team last year that are back that can that are a big part of that culture of I don't care if I'm a starting defensive player, an offensive player, I'll play special teams, I'll go out and hit somebody. So I thought that was really good. The second part was his kind of self-introspection about wanting to have more fun in the process. Yeah. Uh, I think he joked that Jay Sean Polk, who know, knows him from Kent State, was like, wait, what happened to you? Who are you? Right. You're actually talking about being having fun. And I and I think that, that that's just – it's an evolution of him. And it's also how things are kind of going. And he realizes that, like, players aren't the same players that they were 5, 10, 15 years ago. And they they need to be coached differently. And uh, what works in 2024 – or what worked in 2019 probably doesn't work in 2024, right? And I thought that was an interesting, uh, you know, a detail that he told us about, you know, he's trying to enjoy the moment more than he has in the past. Interest, really interesting stuff. I agree. I agree. So I got a question for you. Um, yeah. On our leap year episode, I don't think we actually did one, but it just happened to fall on that. Um, I had given a, I posed a question to you and to Johnny basically saying that in the next leap year, will Sean Lewis continue to be the coach at San Diego State? And I think you landed on the idea of saying that he wasn't. You believe that that what he is bringing to San Diego State is so dynamic and is so good that a power conference is going to bring out a Brinks truck in three years, four years, and they're going to attract him to go elsewhere, right? Um Am I, am I am I am I remembering the the correct response? Yes, but I also threw out the potential that it doesn't work out at all, and the team doesn't make a bowl game. And heading into his fifth year, he's probably not going to get an extension. Is probably going to get not going to be the coach anymore for negative. That would be five years. That'd be five years. Right, but there's very. I thought you landed. I thought you landed on like if you were going to say which one of the two. I thought you were leaning more towards that. I am. I am. Okay. Okay. Like, okay. Okay. No, very, very rarely does a coach go into his final year of his contract without getting an extension. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like Justin Hudson, we talked about this with Justin Hudson. Like the moment he didn't get an extension heading into this year, we knew he was done at Fresno State. Right. All right. That's a rare thing. You don't see that very often. So, I'm yes, sorry, I agree with you. I, my recruit. opinion is that it'll be on the positive side and someone will poach him away. Right. But I think on the flip side could be negative as well. And after four years, but anyway. Yeah, yeah. So here's the question. Let's say your inclination, we don't want to use the strong word prediction, um, is that, you know, it happens. And Sean Lewis, after three years, um, Wisconsin says, we're going to bring back a native son. He can't, he went to school here. We're going to, we're going to do Wisconsin, but fast. Um, Badger fast becomes their offense, right? Um, is Zach Barton the next head coach of the San Diego State Aztecs? And and I'm just going to – let me preface this just a little bit more before you give your answer. J.D. Wicker hires from within. Mm -hmm. Zach Barton told us that his ambition is to be a head coach. Who better to carry on in the scenario that I'm presenting you of a successful Sean Lewis program than his chief lieutenant who has known him through his entire coaching period what do you got i'm leaning towards no okay 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 Talk because i think if that happens that means the offense is really good and you're gonna want or need to keep the offense good and you know whether it's you also got to think about if sean lewis is going to a power five coach yeah. to be a head coach he's going to take his guys with him right and Zach Barton and Matt Johnson are probably those first two guys he's going to take with him. Uh, because coordinator positions at Wisconsin at a power five could actually potentially pay more than a head coach position in the Mountain West. So that's one way of looking at it. Another mm -hmm. way is I think if I think you're going to want to hire another offensive minded coach to keep that offense going and not necessarily be someone that was you know, the special teams coordinator. Uh, now we'll see how things play out. A lot can happen in two to three years. Sure. But as we sit here today, I would lean towards 
Zach Barton going with Sean Lewis to Wisconsin or wherever for sure. to Wisconsin and um, JD Wicker potentially hiring it from the outside again. Interesting. See, and I and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think Zach Barton could be the the answer to the coaching carousel that could happen at San Diego State or wherever he goes. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't strike me as um, someone who's necessarily hunting the next great job. Um, I think that you look at who J.D. Wicker has hired and he's hired defensive coaches. Um, and then there's this guy who is a graduate assistant who's sitting learning in offense underneath Sean Lewis, getting to see it day to day. A native son who would be the perfect offensive coordinator to retake the reins under a Zach Barton regime. Are you talking about Ryan Lindley? Yes, sir, I am. Well, he's a senior offensive analyst. He's not a grad assistant. Did I say grad assistant? I didn't mean yeah. that. I knew what he was. Uh, but anyway, I so I I could see that. And, and to be truthful, I think um, with Matt Johnson, I think you would have to offer him, um, I think you would have to offer him something more than a position coach, because I do think that being able to be an offensive coordinator of a team that was good enough to make you pay for the head coach, you'd have yeah. to offer something more than a position coach. And Matt Johnson could step into that offensive coordinator role, having already done it as well, even like with fully with the offense. All right. Well, that was just a little fun mind thing, man. One other, one other part that, that I think we should talk about is, um, Aztecs are going to the Sweet 16. Yeah, I mean, we jump on here maybe 10 minutes after that game ends. Um, I, I would say every Aztec fan probably relished this coast-to-coast -coast, uh, 20 to 30-point victory. Yeah. Considering how some of the games, almost all the games this year have been basically, you know, down to the last second. Um, it was, it was, um, uh, it was interesting watching them basically coast for, you know, the last 30 minutes of the game. Um, but yeah, it was the shooting for one game was there. I mean, between Elijah Saunders and Miles Bird and Darion Trammell, I mean, those guys, I think they made like seven or eight threes, just the three of them. Uh, Reese Waters still struggled. Um, it would have been nice, I think, for the Aztecs and for Coach Dutcher to, to get Reese Waters going in that second half. But he still, I don't, I don't know if he made a shot today. Uh, yeah. I didn't see the box score, but he, he, he wasn't able to get going. But everybody else, Jaden Ladee was a beast as as usual, and Lamont Butler was his usual uh, pest defensively on Pulakides and uh, reaches his thousandth point and hundredth win, which is very impressive as an Aztec. So, so overall, it was a great performance. You beat a 13 seed, but you play the teams that are in front of you, and a 13 seed beat the four seed who happened to be a top 10 ranked team in the, all the metrics heading into the tournament. So right. um, you beat the teams that are in front of you, right? whatever seed they are, the seeds get thrown out when you, when you enter the tournament at, the, at this point. Yep. And so it was an impressive performance. And now they got to play a uh, big, bad UConn. Again. No, they do. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling because I'm was, was, Help me with this. Was Yale underseeded because they beat a top 10 team or were they overseeded because they lost by so much against the Aztec? I'm just not sure what, 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 you know, how this is, how this it's, works. This whole over under it's so ridiculous. It's so it's, I agree. And, and it's funny. And I, I didn't even mean to wade into it. All I pointed out was that if you're a higher seed, you're more likely to win. That's it. Like, like you're, you know, and people yeah. were just like, here you all go again. I'm like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a you all, first of all. I don't know what you're talking about. But apparently people have been having these conversations. Um, yeah, I thought the Aztec game um, was fantastic. I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is, um, I didn't have the nerve on my preview to be able to do it, but I wanted to write that San Diego State should blow this team out. Um, but I, I took the more cautious, optimistic approach, you know, just kind of saying, you know, the shooting wouldn't be what it was. Um but I just, the youth inside, I thought for, uh, which I highlighted in, in the piece, I just, I, I found it hard that anybody was going to be able to do anything with Ladee. They didn't. He was also making threes. Um, and, you know, I I think going into the UConn game, I think one of the differences is having the opportunity for a couple extra days to be able to go through the offense and and to try to figure out how to, how to do it. Um, you know, you're watching 
them in the first half, um, even more impressively than the first half for San Diego State against Yale, just dismantle Northwestern. Um, I mean, so many easy shots after so many easy shots. Second half wasn't quite that way, but man, yeah. I, I um, it, they were impressive in that first half. And I think the the big thing for the Aztecs is is going to be able to have a great game plan and and then you know doing what they do what they're going to have to, which is they're going to have to shoot well from the outside. Um, and and this is this is really I think where um, somebody like Elijah Saunders really comes about um yukon again has another big seven footer who's just going to kind of stay in the key um and what they're going to do i would assume is they're gonna have somebody else on ladie just like wolf didn't primarily play ladie and then allow him to sag into the key because who's ever on that stretch four um and so if they can hit some threes which then forces them to kind of come out a little bit, um, then I think you 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 could have you know some potential to have a game, um, but all in all, man, I I think it's it's a it's a unbelievable testament to Brian Dutcher to his staff um, to you know J E Pollock who's no longer on the staff but you know has been part of building this thing, um, you know I was and am of the opinion that the, a team like they had last year is not going to show up again. And they're not going to have that much age, the COVID year, yada, yada, yada. And to be back in the Sweet 16, if they go further um, and knock off the number one seed overall again, uh, this is one of the best back-to-back coaching performances, period. Like, I'm sure there's other ones that, I'm sure there's other ones that can beat it. But you you would have to go and say at a school like San Diego State to be able to get to back to back elite eights or obviously the championship game and then to an elite eight with a with basically a brand new nucleus there, um, it would be pretty special. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think playing UConn is hard enough, but having to fly cross country on a Thursday and then you know. Stores, Connecticut to Boston is a seven, it's 75 miles. It's an hour and a half drive. It's going to be a big Boston. I mean, a big Yukon crowd. Yeah. There will be Aztecs who will make the trip for sure. There are definitely a lot of diehards, a lot of, uh, a lot of great Aztec fans who, you know, will be able to do it because they can get away from work or they have the money. And, and But a lot of Aztec fans won't be able to just because it's, such a long trip and it's in the on a Thursday as you said like that's going to make it really difficult I think to get a big Aztec crowd there and it's going to be very pro UConn now they played Aztecs played Alabama in Louisville last year not the same close proximity from Alabama and Louisville and and maybe because it's SEC country or you know in that area that there's a non you know a lot of guys a lot of people that don't like Alabama and they rooted against Alabama but I don't think you're going to see that as much up in Boston. But uh, this is the fourth time San Diego State has made the Sweet 16. The first yeah. three times they did, UConn won the championship all three times. Twice San Diego State played them and lost to them. So this right. is their chance to kind of reverse some of the, the history of that. And, and they get to do it by beating them, right? Uh, obviously, they have to, they have to beat them uh, on Thursday, but they get to kind of rewrite that history a little bit. Um, it's going to be tough. Um, it was going to be tough playing Alabama last year, but, you know, Alabama wasn't the defending champion with one of the best coaches in college basketball and one of the best, you know, just overall, you know, game plans that they always put together. You know, Alabama, yeah, was, Alabama was, you know, a couple NBA prospects and kind of thrown together mishmash right and they were very talented but you, you they were used to game plan against them and, and to beat them and UConn is a different beast but they're not to say they're not beatable I mean they lost games this year um and it's just uh coach Dutcher and the staff are gonna have to find the right the right buttons to push and obviously they've, they've got to play well everybody they're gonna need like a game like tonight where they had six or seven guys play well 
Uh, they're gonna need that on Thursday. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know, I, I think talking about you know rebuild, so many of those guys from UConn were not there last year too, and yeah. they were able to do it again. Is just is is something. But again, with the history that's at UConn, it's a little bit easier to rebuild than at a place like San Diego State. Um, you know, I, I I still think that Reese Waters, I think he's gonna have a big game. Um, I think that sometimes when you're playing in your first real pro postseason games and things like that, it takes a little bit to get your legs under you. Um, and so I, I think that they're and I to your point, I think they're gonna need them. Um, but not really today to worry about. I mean, they they got through Spokane. Um, they they won both games. Chris uh, Spearing, thank you, dude, for going up there and 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 you know repping EVT there. Um, but I I just you know it's 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 great. I mean, this has been an unbelievable run uh, for for the Aztecs these last two years. Um, and you know, obviously, they need to keep it going. But I think um, you know wrapping it up for my thoughts. You know, I thought Coach Zach Barton was. Um, great i thought he was incredibly honest um you know if, if you're that honest about yourself in an interview with guys that you just met guarantee you he's that way on the recruiting trail um i guarantee you you know just 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 that you know plus one mentality of like getting better every day like you saw kind of that same sort of thoughts from him like i am i need to be who i am i can't copy other people at the same time i got you know and he was kind of doing that live with us and so um, I thought it was as, as we're getting those looks into the staff, um, I, I thought it was a good introduction for us. Yeah, absolutely. This is the first of hopefully seven or eight of these that we're going to, we're going to, we've done a few of them already that'll be coming out and we've got a few more scheduled this upcoming week. Um, it's just a really good way because, you know, these are new people to San Diego state, mm -hmm. um, that we're not very familiar with. Now, Mike Schmidt is probably the one that we are because he coached here before, uh, but he's been gone for several years. So it'll be good to catch up with him, but all the other coaches are are brand new in a sense to, to San Diego. And uh, so it was, it was cool catching up with uh, well, coach Barton first, and then we've got several more coming up. Uh, should be good. All right, guys, uh, as always, we appreciate you guys listening. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, our interview with coach Barton. Uh, as always, thank you for liking, sharing, subscribing, following uh, the podcast on all your favorite platforms, and we'll talk to you guys next time. You are listening to the SDSU Podcast presented by the East Village Times with your hosts Andre Hagverdian and Paul Garrison.